Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa McNeil. I'm the director of the Hampton Library here in Bridgehampton, and we're so excited to have Marie Brenner talk about her book, Desperate Hours, and to have David Alpern talk with Marie about her book, Desperate Hours. I'll just give a brief introduction to David. Uh, starting in 1966, David was a reporter, writer, and senior editor at Newsweek magazine, mostly in national affairs and international sections after early stints at the pre-Murdoch New York Post, Daily Journal of Elizabeth, New Jersey, and United Press International in New York. In 1982, David launched Newsweek On Air, a weekly hour-long network radio broadcast, later a podcast, heard across the country and worldwide via Armed Forces Radio. Just gonna let people in. On that show, he got to talk with newsmakers and VIPs, including actress Katherine Hepburn, Washington Post publisher Katherine Graham, Watergate's Woodward and Bernstein, and ex-Mrs. <laughs> Bernstein, the beloved filmmaker Nora Ephron, and several times with both Pulitzer winning biographer Robert Caro, our neighbor in East Hampton, and spy novelist John Le Carre, whose appearances with David are collected on our Hampton Library YouTube page. Now full-time resident of Sag Harbor, David writes book reviews for the East Hampton Star, presents programs like this one live and Zoomed for local libraries, and plays a lot of what he calls nearly tennis. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks also to the Hampton Library, other local libraries bringing the, this presentation to uh, far-flung Zoom Hampton and uh, beyond. <laughs> Special thanks, of course, to Marie Brenner for taking time to take us inside the Desperate Hours for extraordinary report on the frantic first phase of COVID at the giant New York Presbyterian healthcare system. 11 hospital campuses with 47,000 employees all were caught up first in a, a frenzy of fear, frustration, death, then courage and innovation, finally inspiration as we all continue to cope with a virus and variants that still kill about a thousand daily worldwide, leaving some seven million dead by this week's third anniversary of the World Health Organization declaring COVID a pandemic. Uh, perhaps millions more have been compromised physically or mentally to greater and lesser degrees, long COVID. Copies of Marie's book will be for sale online after this Zoom through special arrangements with Bookhampton um, that you can find in the chat. Uh, a digital audio version is immediately available, or you can pre-order the paperback due in June. A Kindle edition can be found at Amazon.com. Uh, now let me say a bit about Marie herself, actually an old friend. Uh, a San Antonio native with degrees from the University of Texas at Austin and the NYU Film School, she was the first female baseball columnist covering the American League for the Boston Herald. Later wrote for New York Magazine, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, then Vanity Fair again, and now a writer at large there. Her 1996 article on uh, whistleblowing about deadly additives to cigarette tobacco led to the Oscar-nominated film The Insider in 1999 with Russell Crowe and Al Pacino. Her 1997 article on a security guard wrongly suspected in the Olympic Park bombing was in part the basis for the 2019 film, Richard Jewell. And her 2012 piece about the daring eye patch wearing combat correspondent, Marie Colvin, targeted and killed by the Assad regime in Syria was adapted for the 2018 film, A Private War, starring Oscar nominated actress, Rosamund Pike. Uh, far ranging topics to be sure. But her work on our war with COVID actually began not far from her house in East Hampton. The Sag Harbor residence of Dr. Stephen Corwin, a cardiologist who rose from resident to president and CEO of New York Presbyterian, and with whom she had to work out ground rules for the warts and all reporting that she had in mind. So Marie, tell us about that first meeting, uh, why and to what degree Corwin was willing to pull back the curtains uh, from the intensive care units to the executive suites. How much persuading did you have to do? Well, it's such an incredible story, and especially that we're talking about it now almost three years into the pandemic. 
Um, first of all, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, David, for hosting me. Uh, I have spent so much time in your library, Lisa, and in the East Hampton Library working on these books and articles that, for me, this is like coming home. Um, saying that, when I got the first call from my agent, Binky Urban, another Bridgehampton resident, saying that New York Presbyterian, this was June of 2020, wanted a reporter to come in and actually document what had gone on during the first horrible surge of COVID in 2020, I said, oh, come on, this is a trick. This is some sort of a PR thing. New York Presbyterian, are you kidding me? That's not happening. And she said, no. Seriously, they are saying that they want to pull the kimono back, that they're going to, they want a reporter to come in and just tell this story for history. And I just said, Binky, this is, this is just not, this is a, some sort of a Trojan horse. Um, you know, come on, a $9 billion healthcare system. What CEO would allow a reporter to come in and roam around the hospital and try to figure out everything they did wrong and everything they did right? And she said, well, just go take the meeting. So I, I, there was a series of preliminary meetings and I finally get to Dr. Corwin sort of at the, in the middle of July. And it was, it was astonishing because we all remember what it felt like in the Hamptons in the summer of 2020. Everyone was still very, very nervous. There were lines that you had to queue up outside the stores, that you had to wait in line at Citarella, you couldn't get into the toy stores. No one wanted to go inside. Everyone had paper towels outside in their outside bathrooms. You know, people were getting special lawn furniture so they could entertain outside. And it was a kind of a misty day in Sag Harbor. The Corwins live in a, a rather modest house that they've had for decades. And I, we had this extraordinary conversation. I learned that day that Dr. Corwin, besides having come up as chief resident at Columbia and running the ICUs of Columbia and then working his way up to be the head of the hospital, this extraordinary cardiologist was as well a voracious intellectual and an amateur historian. And at the height of the horror at the end of March 2020, they had started from three patients on March the 3rd. By the end of the month, they had 2,500. They ran out of everything. They ran out of sanitizers. They ran out of fent fentanyl. They ran out of everything. This was Mount Olympus, our number one healthcare system at that time. And at the, at the height of this in March, when he and his wife, Ellen, who he met when she was his nurse, when he was chief resident at Columbia, he turned to Ellen and he said, Ellen, when this is over, this horror, I am going to get a reporter to come in and document this. And she looked at him and she said, okay, but the board is not going to like that idea. And he said, I don't care. And he got a lot of pushback inside the hospital. So when we had this extraordinary meeting in this summer, um, we were sitting outside and I tried not to react when he pulled his chair even further than the six feet apart. And we were both masked. And it began to rain about an hour or two in. And literally, we moved into his shed where he kept his rakes and his trash bin. And we stayed there all afternoon. Because I think Dr. Corwin, like everyone at the hospital day, was so rocked by what had happened to them. Imagine they had deans who were like, they had deans who were sitting in the basement at Columbia having to fold and refold um, scrubs that had come 600,000 pairs because they had come mismatched. They had to deploy the deans of the medical schools to do this. And, you know, they had to get sanitizer from the prison system. This was New York Presbyterian, the greatest hospital. And at one point, he realized he had a two-day supply of masks, two days. They had had an estimate before saying that they thought they would be fine in late February. They had 90,000 masks stockpiled. It turned out they needed 90,000 a day by the end of March. And so that's where we started. And over and over, he said to me that day, I want you to talk to everyone and get their direct experience so this could be understood for the next generations of doctors who go through a pandemic. And indeed, um, he was good. He was as good as his word. I had no idea that day, however, and I've been thinking about it so much in the last couple of weeks because 
I had no idea that what would happen is I would discover this love story of New York, this all classes, all casts coming together in this essentially two month drama, which, you know, we're still trying to get over in the city. So how many interviews did you end up doing with what variety of sources and how did you map out uh, your reporting? Well, that was a process, you know, again, as you said, 47,000 employees, where do you even begin to tell the story? How do you, as we say in journalism, get your cast? Who can be the people that embody this? So I interviewed over 200 people and I was aided in the beginning by this extraordinary woman called Emmy DeLand, who was their chief strategy officer, who gave me lists and lists and lists. And I just began. I wanted to follow. I wanted to follow. First, they said, Marie, you're going to need to do this all on Zoom because we're still not over the pandemic and it's way too virulent in the hospital. And I said, no, I'm sorry. There's no way I'm doing this on Zoom. I'm going to be in that hospital. I'm going to meet the people. I have to be in the room. So we developed a sort of an elaborate protocol of how that would work. And I wanted to follow the way the pathogen had actually come into New York, to follow it for history. So I started up in the most unlikely place, Bronxville, which of all things, patient zero, Lawrence Garbuz, well, he's not really patient zero. He doesn't like it when people call him that. He was in fact the second patient, but the first one diagnosed in the hospital. The lawyer from New Rochelle had wound up you know, with this horrible cough and pneumonia in the emergency room of this beautiful community hospital. And the day I went in July, they had gathered around the table, the head of the ICU, um, the extraordinary associate director of quality control, Dr. Frisbee, you know, so many people, several nurses, and some of their hands were shaking. And it was clear that they had not even thought about what they had been through. By the end of the first hour, several of them were sobbing. And I will never forget like talking to the critical care people. And they just, you know, doctors are not really trained to emote. And they had just been through the most traumatic a medical incident of any career, a once in a once in a century episode. So in a sense, it was like it was like they were unburdening themselves for the first time. David, I felt so privileged as a reporter to be able to hear their stories and to have it, you know, just to have them say, we were so terrified, we didn't see our children for weeks at a time. So that's how I began. I started in Bronxville, then I moved down to Columbia, uh, which is where Dr., which is where Larry Garbuz was moved into the ICU on March the 3rd. That was really the first time in New York. And you know, part of this was understanding the drama of the larger drama of New York, that at San Francisco had shut down by then. But as we remember, our mayor and our governor were fighting. They didn't think this was real. And I, you know, it's like so enraging when you think that Mayor de Blasio was saying things like, we only have six cases recorded in New York, but that's because there were no tests in New York. No one could get tested. And, you know, this kind of idiocy that um, was just, it was absolutely traumatic for the doctors because, you know, doctors are trained to analyze data. And suddenly to have these political clowns who do not understand a public health care crisis put them all in enormous jeopardy, much less their patients. So after his initial okay, how did Corwin help when staffers, uh, even top staffers, resisted your question? Well, this was a long process. You know, I what I did was I met so many people of so many different levels at the hospital, and some were forthcoming and some weren't. But it was clear that the initial they weren't exactly sure who I was or what I was doing there. And they were very nervous about talking to me because what I discovered early on is that when you are hired at a hospital system, you have to essentially sign a version of an NDA or a confidentiality agreement, which you would have more or less anyway, because you have HIPAA concerns and privacy. But the doctors at New York Presbyterian had had several episodes inside the hospital, and I know we'll get to that later, 
where they had been actively threatened by the corporate side for speaking out early and trying to warn the nation about what they were seeing in our in at New York Presbyterian and particularly at Columbia and Weill Cornell, because these are some very, very well known doctors and doctors who write and doctors who publish books um, who are in the system who go on television and um, you know, uh, we're trying to warn, don't come to our emergency rooms. There's no tests at Wild Cornell. Don't do this. This is a nightmare. You know, the city should be shut down. This is the first and second week of March. So I suddenly appear and then the hospital, the people running the hospital under the under Dr. Corwin's level would immediately upbraid them and say, if you do this again, you're going to be, you're going to lose your visiting you're going to use your privileges because they really work for the medical school side they work on the medicine side and you know there was it got very very hot in the hospital there was a kind of a constant war going on so i i walked into this without understanding that they all were under a gag order and about two or three months into it i was at a dean's in the dean's office at columbia uh, who runs the, uh, the bioethics department. And he suddenly burst out because he was one of the ones who was muted. Don't you know there's a gag order in the hospital? And I said, what? I mean, you know, that's how naive I was. I'm not a doctor. I've never worked in a, a health care system. I assume since Dr. Corwin was so voracious about wanting to know everything that gone on in the hospital, that this would not be so difficult. But there was this kind of weird cotton batting around all of the interviews at first. So you know, I, I called and I said, you know, this is a real problem for me. You know, like they, I'm an Alice in Wonderland. You know, on the one hand, you want a you want a book of integrity. You know, this is like it's got to be a book of absolute reportal repertorial integrity. On the other hand, all of these scared doctors, some of the best and the brightest in the world are afraid they're going to get fired if they speak to me. And without any hesitation, he said, give me a list of 20 people that you would like to go deeper with, and I will call each and every one of them and tell them that they will be in no jeopardy and that we that the hospital is invested in having a truthful account. Now, and he did it. That afternoon, he took no calls. He just worked his way down this list. I had worked my way by this time through Brooklyn, through Queens, through lower Manhattan. I'd gotten a so real sense of the sort of how the hospital lays out. Because the fact is, New York Presbyterian is New York City. It starts in lower Manhattan with that incredible small hospital that like services Chinatown and got so shelled during 9-11. You work your way up to the great Emerald City while Cornell, the old New York hospital. You go to Columbia, you know, the Milstein Pavilion, but that amazing research center. And then you're in Brooklyn, you're in Queens, you're in, up in Bronxville, you go up to the Hudson Valley. It really is New York and you're in Brooklyn. And, um, you know, I had people in each hospital that I felt had a, a really relevant and at all levels, some were nurses, some were housekeepers that I wanted to have this kind of candor with. And Dr. Corwin did. Now I ask, you know, what other CEO of a hospital system with so much litigation that could be possible would allow this to happen? You know, I, I just, I, I cannot say how surprised and unusual this was. What were the staffers and especially the doctors most worried about revealing? Well, all kinds of things. I mean, you know, first of all, like let's take let's take what happened at while Cornell, you know, again, the Emerald City of the Upper East Side of medical care. There's Dr. Matt McCarthy, one of our finest young epidemiologists, you know, he's a doctor, he calls himself a physician scientist. He was he'd gone to actually he played baseball with Ron DeSantis, who was his <laughs> groomsman at his at his wedding. And it took me a year to get Dr. McCarthy to speak to me because he had had this real run in with the hospital, which was that on March the 3rd, he went on Squawk Box, he'd published several books, one of which so um, so incredible the background he'd been a southpaw 
pitcher for the Yale baseball team, the same one that DeSantis was on, throwing a 90 mile an hour fastball. And he was drafted by the farm team of the Los Angeles Angels. They blasted him out in about a year, but I think he's the only, he's the only person at the pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball who said, well, that's okay, I've been accepted to Harvard Medical School. And, you know, he's a brilliant, brilliant doctor. Then he wrote a bestseller about that experience. Then he went to, he went to Harvard Harvard. The, th the following summer, he was in Africa trapping Ebola bats, you know, to try to figure out that crisis. Then he trained at Columbia as a resident. He wrote an experience, a book about that. So when 2020 rolls around, he had, was working with uh, a rare bacteria expert at Columbia called Dr. Tom Walsh. Um, and he had written a book about Walsh and their work called Superbug. So he was pretty much around. He was very much a media presence. So as the as the as the pandemic was rolling in, there he was on Squawk Box and he comes into the hospital about five in the morning from his house in Irvington. And he was in the emergency room and he was so struck by you know, the, the chaos and the fact that you couldn't get tested and people were coughing and that unless you had been to Wuhan or to China, you couldn't get a test. We all remember those days. But imagine it from the doctor's point of view and a doctor of this magnitude. So he goes on that morning. He was on Squawk Box an hour or two later, and he like just is very even handed. He was in no way alarmist. He said, I'm here to tell you this is going to be a disaster. The fact that the city hasn't shut down is very alarming and it should have shut down already. And he said, don't, you know, don't go to the hospital. There are no tests there. I mean, he was very, very even, but very definitive. That I, should, I, should, I should interrupt to say that you make the point that he went on television, but not with his New York Presbyterian. Exactly. He was very, expert. very careful. And he just author. put on, you know, doctor and author superbugs. So by two o'clock, that was a huge headline in the New York Post online. Then it ran, you know, by three o'clock, he'd gotten his first email from the corporate relation, public relations department saying, you know, you've got to, you don't, we don't want, this is alarmist, you have to check before you go on. By the next day, he was called, the next day or so, he was called in and literally threatened with the loss of one of his titles. He was running one of their medical pavilions, the Greenberg Pavilion, one of the floors. And, you know, it was just extraordinary. You know, the idea that they would try to gag a doctor of this caliber. But that was the corporate side. The medical school side was so outraged that Dr. McCarthy was being shut down that the head of the medical school, the hospitalist program that oversees what Dr. McCarthy does inside the hospital, literally said to them, the corporate side, you don't give Dr. McCarthy our titles, we do. He works for us. And not only is he not going to lose any of his titles? He is going to be our first director of COVID patients at Weill Cornell, in which, and he was. And but they refused to let him, the corporate side, appear on any any other program. And what's really ironic about this, and again enraging as a member of the public, what's really ironic about it is when he got off the air from Squawk Box, he had many messages waiting for him, including the Secretary of the Army and Jamie Dimon, uh, you know, who wanted him to brief his whole Wall Street team, the Secretary of the Army who wanted him to brief, you know, the leadership of the military. I mean, that is how powerful he was as a witness. And all of that came to an end. And this kind of a story I heard again and again and again through the hospital. And it what 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 happened with these doctors particularly is a form of moral injury that many of them told me even a year or two later and i think some of them still feel this way that the hospital's failure to allow them to speak and bear witness about what they were seeing in the first weeks of march they feel has led into the larger state of disinformation and anti-science which soon gripped the country and I, I do think there's some truth to that. 
Um, this next question deserves a little video introduction. So excuse me while I share the screen for a minute and, and bring this up. One of the uh, most surprising discoveries you made, at least surprising to me, although now you you put it in context, was the negative reaction among the medical staff to the nightly clanging of pots and pans celebrating them uh, from city streets, windows, rooftops. Uh, why were they not pleased? Well, this was a selective thing. This was a sele I heard this about six. I heard this several months into the reporting from someone who from several who were working in the ICUs particularly because you know let's let's talk about the medical gladiators these are this group of doctors particularly Dr. Lindsay Leaf who ran the pulmonary critical care ICU 5 south who's one of my main characters in the book they were shelled they had, did not have enough doctors. Obviously, they didn't have enough ventilators. They didn't have enough trained nurses. We all have that. They felt a bit like World War I infantrymen that were being rolled out to be uh, collateral damage. Many of them got sick. I mean, doc in Dr. Leaf's case, she couldn't see her children for three months. They had to be sent to the country. And there was so much anger coursing around the hospital as one person said to me you could burn the place down because again they felt that the hospital system had not protected them i mean it, this took the hospital a couple of weeks to get up and rolling by the middle of march say the third week of march dr corwin had committed about a billion dollars immediately to hotel rooms volunteer doctors you know, food, 3,000, you know, 3,000 people and all of their families were getting fed. I mean, it was a huge outlay. And he would just say to the board, I don't care. I don't give a damn what it costs. We have to protect our people. And this took them, it took them a while to get up and going. But when those pot, when the banging started, the ICUs were overwhelmed. We had morgues on the street, you know, pot banging, fine. Prayers and pots. Okay, great. Within the ICU, all they're seeing is death everywhere. One of my characters, Dr. Bradley Hayward, was intubating sometimes 10 or 12 people a day. You know, again, they're I'm always drawn to people who have such resilience in a crisis. I want to know how do you show up? What makes you do this? What what makes you act, not even think about the fact that you will be uh, a leader in a crisis? And that that kind of never ever questioning it was something that really drew me to this. Well, indeed, beyond the bureaucratic threats, threats, there was the threat of COVID itself to doctors, nurses, aides, room cleaners, yes. uh, especially with mixed messages on wearing masks if, if they were even available. So how did that overall fear and that, and that crisis affect uh, uh, the impact of the staffing day to day? I mean, how many people continued to show up? Well, Ramar, you know, they had 35 people die within the system, which is, you know, horrendous. And even now, there's no memorial that's been put up to them anywhere. You know, like if, if there had been a terrorist attack, we would have, you know, extraordinary statues and everything. But the hospitals, and this isn't just New York Presbyterian, across the, across the city, the non-academic, you know, the academic institutions don't like the idea of people dying on their watch. So you won't see, you won't see memorials and you will not see, you know, taps and you will not see all the things that we would do in a terrorist attack. How did they feel? Well, you know, they felt they had a mission. They're driven to save lives. They, it, was a, it was a mission thing. Um, th there was sharing of masks. There was this one extraordinary nurse that worked with Lindsay Leaf, Judith Cherry. And they, when they realized that there were no masks, and, you know, they were all sobbing. What were they going to do? One of the mothers made what they called schmatas, like could, could like hair, hide their hair. This nurse said to Dr. Leaf, Lindsay, I know where there's a lot of half-used boxes 
um, N95s hidden that people are not using in the closets in the hospital. So before the big onslaught hit, Judith Cherry masked all these, you know, she just amassed all these boxes because no one would need, no one needs those N95s more than in um, the pulmonary critical care unit. And it was Dr. Leaf's task, which she did brilliantly, to turn really all of Wild Cornell into one big ICU. But imagine this, you would walk in, in this kind of deserted hospital, and you would see all the doctors who had been deployed, uh, you know, from every from every department, you know, urologists, uh, you know, account when everyone had been deployed. Some of them were wearing snorkel equipment from their parents' basement. I mean, there was not for the first few weeks. There just wasn't the equipment, and on top of that, the state regulations were changing by the hour. So if you were on the corporate side, you couldn't go rogue. I mean, because they would say to the doctors, well, you know, we can't go against what New York State is allowing us to do. When I started reporting, I first heard the story about the Roche machine at Columbia. This was a testing machine. I think it's one of the only ones in the city that was could have the Columbia had it for some experimental work. I think they had done. And before that, I think they got it for the HN. N1 uh, flu crisis, but they could have been testing 5,000 people a day at Columbia for the first two weeks of March. And it was so, it was so bureaucratic between the state and the city that some of the, the prize winning scientists who are at Columbia, because they could get the recipe easily of how to test yourself, it's a simple thing. They were going in and testing themselves, but yet the patients couldn't get it. And there was this complicated procedure you know, they would have New York State troopers come down. They, the lab results would have to be, you know, they would be sped up to um, a New York State laboratory. You couldn't get the, the testing kits that the CDC were only allowing the hospitals to use were basically rotten. I mean, we know all of this. We've read, you know, the accounts. But the WHO and the CDC did not equip themselves well in this. Uh, one of the resources that was there, but 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 sort of dubious as it comes out in your book, were the, were the ventilators, uh, which uh, had a danger in themselves, especially to the oldest and sickest patients. Talk about that, and indeed the the legal threat of either permitting them to be used or or not a, or not letting a patient use it. Well, let's pull this back a little bit to talk about the medical gladiators who were so phenomenal during this, who kind of shored up. I mean, really, at one point, Dr. Corwin early on gave an all hospital briefing and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the cavalry isn't coming. You know, we're in this for ourselves. I mean, this is how dire it was. You know, it, even at the time, he said, we are guilty of a willful, an, you know, a, perhaps an unwillful suspension of belief about what could happen to them. Pull this back a little bit. One of I'm always attracted to the personalities that are under the under the narrative of an event. And one of the most fascinating ones that I met along the way was a doctor named Nathaniel Hoopert, who is a scientist modeler who had been at the CDC, an expert on disaster management, who has also supported his family by working as a hospitalist in lower Manhattan. He grew up in New York. He went to Stuyvesant. His father was a museum director, and he's been a polymath since his days at Stuyvesant, where he was doing these remarkable modeling experiments from the time he got to Harvard Medical School and later. And coming into Weill Cornell in 2000, he was tasked with figuring out how you would get emergency antibiotics to the city of New York. And he, this was an extraordinary grant they got. And he was all, this was called Operation Torch. And he had set this all up to have like the FBI there to figure out this modeling exercise. And as he slept late that morning because he knew he was gonna be up for 24 hours, he looked up in time to see the World Trade Center go down. If he had not slept late, if he had not, he would have been on that pier. So ever since then, and soon after he got one of those consultancies at the CDC, so he was working on this and he always understood this whole thing of chance. As the virus blew in, 
he was one of the first ones who got a call about this and he remember the the, the red dawn chain there was a there was a kind of an inc extraordinary man who was running it was the medical director of homeland security um who couldn't get on trump's radar at all in january of 2020 and he reached out and almost to nathaniel first to these epidemiologists who he knew who had been you know doing disaster modeling and said we've got to start a secret chain of like information sharing because our government is not helping us now this was a trump appointee i think his name is dean de canova and you know this is so uh, hubert was doing these models up in his you know attic in princeton and then working at the same time as a hospitalist in lower manhattan he spent the next six weeks trying to warn the administration at New York Presbyterian about what was happening. He couldn't get on anybody's wavelength. They just thought, you know, this isn't happening. You know, this is, you know, he's making too much of this. And in the parallel to that, the governor of New York used McKinsey, $10 million of modeling. And their modeling numbers were, you know, uh, way, way off, it turned out. And so the governor, Cuomo, kept saying in his briefings, remember this, we're going to have 110,000 patients and we're going to need 44,000 ventilators. Well, you know, that turned out to be off by 10. So Hubert um, worked his way into the Cuomo circle when no one was, when everyone ignored him at New York Presbyterian. And there were these fights that were going on in Albany with many other modelers projections versus the McKinsey ones. So part of the hysteria of March 2020 was, yes, there was a lack of ventilators for several weeks. Yes, this was a real problem. The doctors were afraid that if they put, if they didn't ventilate anyone who asked for them, including 95-year-olds who had their arms crossed, you know, had to break their ribs, um, you know, that they could be they could be sued. Uh, they could they could have murder charges uh, filed against them, like what happened to Dr. Sherry Poe in five days at Memorial. So the doctors were in a state of agony and there were huge fights that these doctors in the ICUs would be having with the ethicists at the hospital who would just say, we're waiting for Cuomo to sign off on uh, what they call critical care emergency uh, restrictions, uh, non-restrictions, which of course he never was going to do. So this was, you know, this was really intense. And at one extraordinary moment, Dr. Corwin was not allowed by the board to go in the hospital because they were so afraid of his health. He was FaceTiming with Dr. Leaf. And he said to her, Lindsay, what can I do to help with you? And she's running this ICU and she just bursts into tears. And she said, Dr. Corwin, we can't, we have three or four patients who are needing one ventilator at a time. You know, we, what do we, you know, we can't, if we do anything. And he said, whatever you decide to do, the hospital will back you up. And of course, you know, would they, who knows? It, 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 it finally. Let me, just, let, let me just clarify that Hubert at the beginning said it's going to be much worse than a bad flu, but yes. McKinsey made it so much worse that we were all victims, even Cuomo, of the, the usual common sense, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst, because right. the McKinsey was so um, terrible yeah. that it ended all uh, other surgeries, yes. all of the operating rooms that were turned to ICUs, Absolutely. And, and was part of the reason that Cuomo sent elderly patients back to nursing homes. That's that right. Not That's prepared. right. And it was they made it every worse. Day. The, yep. the worst was had been exaggerated uh, extremely. And the truth is, there was this 10 day period where they did have a huge shortage of beds. They did have a huge shortage of ventilators. But again, back to the gladiators, the level of innovation it knew, that I discovered inside New York Presbyterian. This is all sounding very dark and apocalyptic, but the level of innovation for example the ventilators kept coming from the state many of them were broken they were disastrous they didn't have tubes at one point this extraordinary doctor at columbia said oh my god what are we going to do he had the genius idea to call the engineering department of columbia the graduate students and said i've got all these ventilators coming can you do 3d printing 
of tubes because there are no tubes in New York. There were no tubes. You couldn't get the supplies. There was this all, you know, there was no, there was no way to get supplies. They were fighting each other, the hospitals over the supplies. And within 24 hours, the Columbia graduate students pulled up in a red to Toyota at the Milstein Pavilion with a circular driveway. And, you know, th this wonderful doctor like rushed out. He's the guy, the, the head of the department said, I'm not even going to, I'm not getting out of the car. You know, it was like so scary, the virus. He popped the trunk and out came the tubes that fit everything perfectly. Another an extraordinary innovator in Brooklyn, I discovered a fantastic character named Felix Cusid, um, who I met very early on. Uh, when I met him for the first time, I heard the Russian accent. I was ushered. He took me down to his basement, basement little office uh, at Brooklyn Presbyterian, now part of New York Presbyterian. And I discover that he has a two room like Miss Havisham's parlor of every ventilator that has ever been made since the 19th century. He's got ones with copper tubes. He has the ones they used during the polio epidemic uh, that called the baby bird machine. And it turned out that Felix had come to this city at age 16, the son of two refused Nick doctors from Ukraine. They had lived in a homeless shelter. He wanted to go to medical school. Of course, he couldn't afford it. He worked his way up and he got to be a respiratory therapist. And his first patient privately was the Grand Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe of Brooklyn, which a detail that I just loved is truly an only in America. And his reputation began to circulate in Brooklyn. And so he was hired at Brooklyn Presbyterian. He rises and rises and he becomes an autodidact of ventilators. He's obsessed with ventilators and he's mentored by Francis Bird, who in fact invented the Bird machine that solved that solved the polio crisis, that got kids off the off the off the iron lung. So when this all began, I mean, everyone within the system, like when New York Presbyterian took over Brooklyn Presbyterian, the corporate side said to him, Felix, this junk you have in this your basement, they, this has got to go now that we're part of this merger. And Felix, with his wonderful Russian accent, said, it goes, I go. So they let him stay there. And he's such a polymath that Columbia, long before the pandemic, would just call him. They, they put him on every committee, the ventilator acquisition committee. I mean, this is, and, you know, he, they would just say, you know, like, what do you think of a, Z, D, like they would like off the numbers and he would just say, it's garbage or get it. So during well, the pandemic, go ahead. In specific, who was behind the innovation of saying we can have more than one person on a ventilator, which that happened up at be... Columbia. That would happen up at Columbia and that happened uh, Dr. Lorene Hill, the head of Columbia, they were so worried that they were going to run out of, of ventilators that they ran an experiment that, that Felix was very opposed to, as were many of the respiratory therapists. He kept, you know, they, they were worried it was going to be like Jekyll and Hyde. In fact, the experiment worked, but there was a lot of criticism about it later inside the respiratory therapy community. And it turned out that it was just so labor intensive because you needed to have double and shifts of nurses monitoring people's individual levels. But what was incredible about Felix Cusid is his wife gets COVID. He's working 100 hours at a time. He's falling you know, against the walls. He's so tired. And by late March, he realizes that his respiratory therapist and a lot of the people across the hospital system were like in real jeopardy when they were going in to suction out the patients. So he goes into his little Havisham parlor storage room. He gets a tube, he gets a shield, he gets some plastic, and he literally fashions this thing that looks like a sort of a TV vacuum cleaner for the head. And he patents it. He called the Felix 2000. It cost all of about $80 or $100 to make. And he sh he sends the video of it working to all these kind of incredibly eminent doctors at Columbia. And they said, oh, my God, Felix, this is utterly genius. Well, it's now used at hospitals all over the country. The money from that patent, he still lives in his little apartment in you know Brighton Beach. The money from that patent is all going to pay for the college educations of the children of all the respiratory therapists that died in America. And if you saw
saw Grey's Anatomy, the first season after the pandemic, you saw the doctors wearing this thing. That was the Felix 2000. So, you know, as a, again, this was the greatest reporting experience I, uh, of my life. To be able to hear the stories of these kind of extraordinary profiles and courage, uh, you know, David, you know, when, how do you get that opportunity to tell the story of New York through these amazing people? I was interested in one of, I guess it becomes a footnote or a sidebar, but uh, uh, there was also some bad advice about vaccines once they became available. Uh, bad advice that particularly upset one first year medical resident at New York Presbyterian. Oh. I think people would like to hear that. Oh my, that was an incredible, you know, reporting uh, moment. Um, so January 2021, I open the New York Times and I see an op-ed by Dr. Carrie Meltzer, Kennedy Meltzer, where she says, essentially, my uncle, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is wrong about vaccines. And his advice is in incredibly dangerous. And I'm a resident, a resident at Weill Cornell. So I immediately had to interview her and I was told, nope, absolutely not. Dr. Meltzer is super private. She only, you know, agreed to do this New York Times thing because she feels so uh, determined about it. Anyway, I begged and begged and she finally agreed. So the day I meet her, you know, we meet in a conference room at Weill Cornell and it was clear she was nervous because she's a writing doctor. She's another one of the doctors like a young version of Matt McCarthy who has literary, you know, a real talent. She'd already written in the Atlantic about her experience and she'd been upbraided by, again, corporate PR for doing this. So as we began to talk, it was clear that she had this extraordinary family history. Her uncle is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Her mother, Kathleen Townsend, was the Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. And her sister was Obama's global health uh, care unit. And three weeks into the pandemic, she's like this resident, she's just working frantically in the ICUs, she can't, and her mother calls her and she says, you've got to take this call. It turns out that her sister was killed in a boating accident, like the first, you know, like in, in the first week of April. So Dr. Meltzer was not only having to cope with the COVID pandemic, her uncle's lunatic advice, but also getting over her sister's death. And she said to me over the course of several interviews, I knew that my sister would want me to speak out. You know, I, she, she said, I used to say to my sister, why do you even put up with listening to him? Why do you even take his calls? Because imagine in the same family, these are global health experts in the Townsend family and the Meltzer family. And, um, you know, she has this uncle who's just caused, one could say, and many believe, you know, so many, many, many people to be unprotected. Although he uh, would disagree. I wonder if you stay in touch much with some of your sources and have a current view or can tell us about their current view of the lessons learned from that experience and how prepared they think we are for the pandemics to come locally. Uh, nationally? Well, I think they have all different kinds of feelings about it. You know, again, it was an unfolding medical mystery. They had the exhilaration of being on the front lines. No one knew if steroids was going to work. One of the first experiments with, with steroids was done by Dr. Kapil Rajwani and Lindsay Leaf's unit. Uh, you know, the, the patients were just dying and there was counter indications that the steroids, you know, which would be traditionally used, had uh, there was some sort of papers that had been done in England that said that they could have you know negative effects. And finally, Dr. Rajwani, uh, who they sort of his nickname is the Yoda, you know Yoda. Um, he said, "Look, they're going to die anyway. We got to try these steroids." And you know they worked. And then it became you know they became obviously the the treatment of choice. They didn't know they were throwing everything at it. They didn't know what to do. So I think they would say, or many of them would say, "We know so much more now than we did then." You know, a story that just moved me beyond uh, was again in Lindsay Leaf's unit, Dr. Ben Gary Harvey, who grew up in a barrio in Colombia and was you know, rose to be a pulmonary critical care, pulmonologist critical care expert in that unit, 
and he had a patient on a ventilator for four months. He had been using uh, something called a Zephyr valve, a new sort of thing that they've been doing in Europe for COPD. And he said, you know, this, this woman who was uh, very athletic in her early 50s, she had days to live, if that. You know, she just like she had shredded lungs. And he said, I'm going to try this on Susie Beebe. And it, all everyone in the unit said, Ben, you can't you know, that's going to kill her. He said, she's going to die anyway. So the husband agreed. He ran the unit one day a week. And the day he ran it, he just said, oh, I'm going to just do this. And so he got the nurses to get all these kind of portable valves that could help her get through a CAT scan. She survived the CAT scan. They put in the valve. The valve worked. Four months later, she was dancing at her son's wedding, admittedly on oxygen. But Susie Beebe is now back home in Brooklyn. She's traveling. She's, you know, living her life. And that, again, Dr. Ben Garrett Harvey said to me when I was talking to him about this, if you didn't, if you don't get out of your swim lane, you can't progress. So, you know, I think now again, the Zephyr valve, thanks to Dr. Harvey, is being used, you know, to treat this. And that was the kind of extraordinary exhilaration of being on the front lines. They know so much more now than they did. Um, I want to make some time for questions or comments from the audience, but Dr. Corwin took some comfort in a line he came across in the 1947 political allegory by Albert Camus titled The Plague, and it sums up much of what you detail in the desperate hours and what you've just been telling us. What's the line? Well, this is kind of remarkable because Dr. Corwin, again, is a voracious reader. You know, he started The Plague reading Roberto Bolaño's 2066, and I said to him, Oh, come on, all 900 pages? I couldn't get through 100 pages. And he said, yep, all 900. And But he waited to read the plague until the summer of 2020. And of course, he didn't see it as an allegory. He saw himself as Dr. Ryu, you know, in the town. You know, And it's like, when he reads, he circles paragraphs about how, you know, the things that he wants to remember. And this one really, you know, this one really for him was the essence of what he had been through. What is true of all the evils in the world is true of plague as well. It helps men to rise above themselves. And I, I definitely think that is the essence of everyone that I met at New York Presbyterian. Marie Brenner, thank you. Uh, I want to make some time for questions and comments from the audience. I'll be happy to read them from the chat, or we might call on some who wrote them to unmute and speak. I'd like to start with some reaction to what you've written and said tonight by one very special member of the audience, Dr. Harvey Schneer of East Hampton, my college classmate, a former colleague of Dr. Corwin, and himself hospitalized at New York Presbyterian for many months and uh, repeated ventilator intubations. Uh, Harvey, how do you grade the treatment you got? What's your, what's your lingering sense of, of that personal experience? Well, thank you for asking me. Um, and uh, let me first say that, uh, Marie, it's a wonderful uh, description you have. I have your book right next to me. We've had it for a month or two. I confess I haven't had a chance to read it, but I will certainly get to it next. Uh, we have a copy. Um, I got sick in March of 2020, uh, and my wife and I shared an ambulance to what used to be called Beekman Downtown and became over several different decades, New York Hospital, Presbyterian Hospital, NYU, uh, was there for approximately two weeks and then transferred to Weill Cornell, where I stayed for three and a half months. Were I you in 5 in South? March. Were you in uh, Lindsay's unit? I, my wife seems to remember her name. My daughter, I have to go back. My daughter kept a daily record of doctors that she talked to and what my status was like, which I've read, but I'll have to go back and see. It certainly is possible. I was in the ICU there for many weeks. I was intubated. I stayed on a respirator for somewhere around two weeks because I had a tracheostomy. Mm. I had multiple complications, bacterial pneumonias, a what called what's called a calculus cholecystitis, a gallbladder infection without stones. That I got a tube in my gallbladder, and I was fed uh, uh, by uh, uh, hyperalimentation for months after that. 
Um, by June, I could sit up for 15 seconds in bed. That was the extent of my ability. And with intensive PT inpatient at Weill Cornell and outpatient for months, I'm back to 95% of what I was before I got sick. Isn't that incredible? Um, so, Another yeah, so, story that sort of parallels yours, Harvey, is that of, of Dr. Tomeko Cato, their great surgeon, you know, who invented ex vivo surgery, who got, you know, many think uh, Kate, uh, COVID uh, from an operation he did where he wasn't adequately protected because, of course, mm -hmm. they weren't aware of the dangers where he mm -hmm. was really, you know, as, as sick, you know, sick for months on that. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is incredible. Did you have ECMO? Did, did they put you on ECMO? No, I didn't need it. Uh, no. My wife and I were hospitalized, shared an ambulance to the hospital, Boy. leaving my three children with essentially no parents. My children made the decision when asked about whether they should uh, uh, DNR me and not, yeah. not left. And I had, like a typical doctor, had already decided that I didn't want the uh, all the paraphernalia if it right. was clear I wasn't going to get better. And my son overruled my decision as I was in coma at that point, medication induced. So I was, I was, uh, I was not ever. I guess I never came to the actual event where I uh, had heart stop and had to have a uh, closed ses chest massage, but it was as close well, enough so my children were asked to make the decision. Your last, question to, last question to Harvey, and then I'd like to open it up. I'm not seeing very many questions in the chat. Uh, Lisa, maybe you're able to read it better than I, but um, from your position now, I mean, not, not that you're connected uh, with the hospital anymore, what's your sense of the preparedness for the next inevitable round of pandemic uh, locally in the hospitals, you know, and, and from your sense of uh, nationally, they've reorganized the Centers for Disease Control. Do you think that all we've learned from dealing with COVID has at least created a better template for dealing with uh, the unknown? You know, I'm asked that frequently, David, and uh, I have to say, um, I don't really. I mean, you know, yes, the CDC now has something called the Pandemic Weather Service. Uh, at New York Presbyterian, Dr. Corwin set up um, an extraordinary early warning system, like his own little mini CDC, right, run by Jay Varma, who had been at the CDC and was our deputy health commissioner, who's super smart, and Nathaniel Hooper, who had been ignored through the hospital, uh, is, you know, working with uh, Dr. Varma on that. But, you know, until there's funding from the government, look at look at what we're going through in Washington. You know, the 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 anti-science, the anti-science um, politicization of this thing that has gripped the country. Uh, you know, I think half the country doesn't even think that that COVID was real, or they think there's no need for masks, or they think there's no need for vaccines. And so if you don't, as we all know, you know hospitals treat sick people, global health people's job is to prevent things like this from happening. If you do not take seriously your global health mandates, um, how do you have a country that can prepare it, be, be prepared? I mean, the countries that did the best were those that had, as we know, 96% compliance. America's record on the pandemic has been appalling for considering that we are a first world country. We come in some like middle toward the, you know, the middle bottom. I was on a Zoom yesterday uh, talking about the Wuhan vaccine lab theory with the uh, the head of vaccine epidemiology at Weill Cornell had a Zoom about it. And in which he essentially said, you know, there's there's some projections that say over 200,000 Americans have been infected with COVID now, which makes sense since we're 350 <coughs> 200 million, 200 million since we're 350 million people. Um, and of those people, are they are they taking would they take the precautions in the future? How do we get this? country that can't agree on anything to agree to global health mandates of any kind. I agree, Harvey, you were nodding your head. So I'd like to hear from you and, and I'd ask Lisa to do your, look through the chat. I'm not seeing any questions here. I don't want to ignore anybody, but uh, uh, let's hear from Harvey. We may have a couple more back and forth and then I think we'll say it was a, a marvelous experience. But Harvey, what's your view? Very good. One comment and then one question for Marie. The comment is, I think she's absolutely correct that we are not 
anywhere near where we need to be as far as identifying the next pandemic, which there will be. Um, the hospitals, I think the only thing, and again, I haven't been practicing at New York Presbyterian for many years, but the hospitals will have gained unbelievable expertise by having been through it once. So it won't exactly. be the first time when it happens again. That's right. On the, on the other hand, the as recently as in a, a couple of months ago, it was either in JAMA or New England Journal, a, an editorial piece saying that the communication among epidemiology groups across this world is hardly better than it was then. And right. unless you are quickly identifying the cause of the next pandemic, you're going to be in the same situation you were before. Absolutely. With one added factor, which is really very, very dangerous, which is the doctor burnout. And the fact that 30, they, at least 30 percent of doctors and nurses say they want to leave the profession. Many nurses have. All the hospitals, as we all know, are desperately understaffed and they're not the nurses aren't paid enough. So you've got that and they don't want to go through this again. They mm -hmm. want to they just don't want to go through it. So if you know people who have been in the hospital in the last year or so, even in our best institutions, you can feel it inside the hospitals. I mean, you know, you feel the shortage. Six or eight months ago, New York Presbyterian was down about 15% of the nurses and mm -hmm. Mount Sinai the same. It just takes a long time to get nurses up and trained. It, the question it does I seem have that the experience had some effect on settling the, the potential strikes of nurses, uh, that their value, I think, had come through so dramatically yes. that uh, what could have been uh, something like is happening in Britain uh, did not happen here. Yeah. No, that's, Can that's I ask all you a quick, true. A quick question, Marie. Sure. The, the uh, designation as gladiators is certainly right on for the people that you were exposed to. I was wondering, as I've been thinking back, the group that I wondered if whether you ever uh, got to were medical students, because the medical students at Columbia were taken out of pre-clinical classes Yes. and put in these situation without the knowledge of the residents or the attendings medically at that point. And you, I wondered if you ever saw any of those and it would be fascinating to speak to some of the medical students who, who had their education interrupted. They got a, a, another type Absolutely. of education. Absolutely. And there was there at Columbia, particularly the emergency room was so shelled. And as we all know, the famous story of Lorna Breen, who was up at Inwood, you know, just north of Columbia, who committed suicide because she was under such pressure when, you know, the, where, where she was in mid Inwood was so shelled. One, one of the things, though, among the gladiators that so fast was so inspired me was at Columbia, they were trying to get people this glut of hundreds and hundreds of people flooding in out of the emergency rooms as quickly as they could. So this extraordinary doctor uh, started something called the surgical SWAT team, where she, uh, Beth Hoffman is her name, where she organized residents and postdocs and fellows and where they literally had backpacks of everything they needed to do, you know, um, lines and you know uh, so they could like speed it up so like whenever they heard of anything all through their epic electronic system they would just race with their backpacks and they like sped this procedure up and there were these it was done like such an ad hoc thing there were like these posters that they just penned all over the hospital saying you know attention any med student you know who wants to be part of the surgical SWAT team and you know they were all volunteering and then that too was part of you know how moving this was of how this city came together with such innovative ways marie i want to thank you again uh, i think our time is about up except to note uh, again an option in the chat to order the desperate hours online uh Thanking Marie again, as well, Lisa McNee uh, at Hampton Library, all the other libraries involved in this presentation, and all of you who've joined us. Good night. Thank you Stay so well. much. And mm -hmm. Dr. Harvey, that's so wonderful. You're a miracle man. You know, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, it. wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, David. Thank